Well, good morning. We're so glad to have you with us today. We are filming from a brand new location. Um, we have been doing these videos for the last several years in Oklahoma. Um, me and my wife has re have recently made a transition. Uh, we were pastoring Sunrise Adult and Teen Challenge in Cache, Oklahoma, and that's the chapel from which we recorded these sermon series. And so we have moved, and now we are part of another ministry that was founded by David Wilkerson, World Challenge, and we will be part of the preaching voice here. I will be uh, preaching alongside men I admire like Gary Wilkerson and Carter Conlon and John Bailey, and so it's a it's a, an honor to be here today. I also hope as time goes by maybe to uh, let you guys know a little more about what we do here at World Challenge, um, taking the gospel around the world um, and, and also supporting world missions, planning churches, supporting the persecuted church. And so we're super happy to be here in beautiful Colorado Springs, and uh, we are going to jump right back in to our sermon series on Romans. Last time we were together, we left off halfway through chapter six. And so we are going to, to enter back into God's word. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll get them out and turn with me to Romans chapter six, we will be in verse 15. And this sermon is titled, Freed from the Slavery of Sin. Freed from the Slavery of Sin. In Romans 15, or excuse me, Romans 6, verse 15, it says, What then? Are we to sin because we are no longer under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves? You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either a slave of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and, and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. God, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for the fact that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, the book of Hebrews says that your word is sharper than any double-edged sword, Lord, and it, and it cuts, Lord, and divides the soul and the spirit and the bone and the marrow and lays bare our intentions, our intentions before you, God. Lord, I pray that right now your word, Lord, for anyone under the sound of my voice would draw those outside of Christ to your saving grace. And for those of us in Christ, God, that it would conform us and sanctify us to the very image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been a while since we've been together. And the last time we were together, we dealt with the first half of Romans chapter 6. Paul started in verse 1 with an antagonistic question. He says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound. And he answers his own question, which is really the question of his critics, by saying, by no means. So Paul, in the beginning of Romans chapter 6, is anticipating a question that the legalistic Jews would be posing to him. 
So if we're not under the law, then what keeps us from doing wrong? How is it that we will, are, are you saying that we should sin to glorify God somehow? Paul's saying by no means. And so now using several examples, he's going to explain what it really means to be under grace. We're going to talk a little bit about the doctrine of justification. The idea that we are right before God because of what Christ did on the cross. And we're also going to talk about the theological concept of sanctification. If we have been freed from the law, does that mean that we can live however we want? Of course not. Verse 2, Paul says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that those of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul is saying that not only have we been freed from the penalty of sin, which he says later in this chapter is death. The wages of sin is death. He's saying not only have we been freed from the looming condemnation that comes with all of those who sin, he's saying we've also been freed from our propensity towards sin. We have a new nature inside of us. We have the very nature of Jesus Christ living in us. Anyone who thinks that they are good enough to make themselves right before God by living a good life, have a very low view of the holiness of God and a low view of how damning sin really is. On the other side of the coin, there's those who feel that grace is a license to, the, to sin. And brothers and sisters, this exposes the same problem. Those who believe that they can earn God's salvation by legalistic works and those who believe that, they, that, that grace gives them a license to sin, both of those groups have the same problem. They believe that, 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 that they can do good because they don't see how grievous sin really is and they don't see how holy God really is. See, the problem isn't the fact that we, we need to try harder to do better. The problem is, is we are dead in sin and trespass. We are hopeless and helpless. That's why the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's saying blessed are those who realize that they're spiritually bankrupt, that their goodness is not good enough. Remember what he said earlier in this book in chapter 3, that our good deeds are like filthy rags. Anyone who thinks that their works are good enough to make them right with God has a very low view of the holiness of God and a very low and unhealthy view of how grievous sin truly is. In verse 5, it says, If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. This is talking about something dying and something being resurrected. I say this all the time when I preach, but Christianity is not the religion of mostly good people who are trying hard at doing better. It's the religion and belief that we were dead in sin and trespass, but through what Christ did on the cross, we are now alive in Christ. We have the very presence of Christ living in us with a new nature and new desires. If you can live your life in unrepentant sin without conviction and with ease of conscience, the question isn't, are, are, are you earning your salvation? The question is, are you really a Christian? Are you really in Christ? Christianity is not a works-based religion. It's an evidence-based religion. 
A new tree will bear new fruit. A good tree will bear good fruit. And the first fruit in the life of every Christian is the fruit of repentance. Listen to what John the Baptist said to the, the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees who came to, to watch what he was doing when he was baptizing people, even before Christ died and rose again. In Matthew 3, 7, he says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. See, Paul is dealing with the same sort of religious system that John the Baptist was. Paul is dealing with people that think because they are born in the line of Abraham, because they are ethnic Jews, that they are okay as long as they are living towards the law. That's why later Jesus would say, listen, you're so worried about cleaning the outside of the cup, but you don't pay any attention to what's inside. And this isn't saying work harder at cleaning yourself up inside. It's saying that if you really peered inside yourself, you would see that your goodness isn't good enough. When compared to the standard of perfection that God gave us in the law. See, the problem the Jews had, the Pharisees had, the religious order of the first century was that they actually believed that some of them were living out the law. Paul was one of these. Paul actually believed that he was living up to a righteous standard. And maybe externally he was. That's why in Philippians chapter 3 he says, Listen, I was a Jew among Jews. I was born in the prestigious tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised on the eighth day. As for zeal, I persecuted these Christians. As for righteousness by the law, perfect. <clears throat> He's like, listen, I, I, did the, I did the things that we were supposed to do. I was way above the rest of my peers. But what happened? What happens? What does he say in, in, in Philippians 3, 7? He says, but now I consider everything loss. Why? Because he's comparing it to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. He's saying, when I really saw who God was, I realized my goodness wasn't good enough. My goodness wasn't good enough. So in Christ, looking at Christ, uh, looking at the holiness of God, we are meant to be drawn to despair. A despair that brings us to our need for Christ. Our need for salvation. Our need for, like the book of, of Zechariah says, one who will arise from among his peers and be a savior beyond that of Moses. It's only through the grace of God that we are saved. And hear me, brothers and sisters. The grace of God is only for those who repent. Those who see God for who he is, holy, unapproachable, unknowable, See our sin for what it is, grievous, death-producing. And in, in, in light of those two things, seeing God's grace for what it is, a beautiful, precious, unearned gift. So in the first half of chapter 6, Paul deals with the question, does the message of grace cause sin to abound? And now in verse 15, he deals with the other side of this question. So let's get into our text. Verse 15, he says, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. One place young Christians and even many young preachers get confused is the relationship between the law of God and the grace of God. Jesus made it clear that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But he also made it clear that no one could be saved under the law. So the question is, how do we reconcile these two things? Here's a very simple way to think about it. 
It's an imperfect uh, statement, but it, but it communicates a very powerful point. The law of God is the diagnosis of the problem. And the grace of the gospel is the cure for the problem. See, the problem with legalists is they believe somehow that, that they can find acceptance from God based on things they do. And you cannot. Listen, one sin caused the entirety of humanity to be, humanity to be spun into perpetual, original sin. <clears throat> so, what's the solution? We, we don't have a solution in ourselves. That's why when the rich young ruler was, went, went away sad when Jesus told him that he had to sell his stuff and follow him because he thought he was living out the law, his disciples looked at Jesus and what did they say? They said, well, goodness gracious, if he can't be saved, this good Jewish man who's done all the right things, then what hope is there for any of us? How can anybody be saved? And what is Jesus' response? Try harder to do better? No, his response is, with man, this is impossible. But in Christ, in God, all things are possible. Man in and of himself could not save himself. And here's a very important truth. If we could save ourselves, then Jesus died for nothing. He died for nothing. If it was possible for the best among us to do right and to be approved by God, then Jesus came for no reason. But Jesus didn't come for no reason because we were dead in sin and trespass. We were hopeless and helpless. And Christianity is about bringing life, bringing good news. It's not what we do. It's what Christ has done. That's the gospel. The good news isn't Jesus did some stuff and now you do some stuff. The gospel is, look what God has done and believe this by faith. This is about being reborn in Christ, having a new nature. <clears throat> the law of God is the diagnosis for the problem and the gospel of grace is the cure for the problem. The problem is this. How can a sinful man be in communion with the holy God? This is God's problem. Like this is... This is the, the question God asked to ask. How can I reconcile men who are sinful to myself? And here's the, the, the truth of the matter. If you don't see this or understand this as an important question or don't even understand the question, it's probably because you don't know who God is. You don't really know who God is. See, because to come in contact with who God is brings fear. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. It's saying if we actually see God for who He is, we will, like the prophet Isaiah, we will be overwhelmed with His holiness. Holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with His glory. When God came in contact with the prophet Isaiah, what did Isaiah say? I'm a pretty good man. I've kept the law. No, what he said was, I am a man of unclean lips who lives amongst people of unclean lips. Because he saw God for who he was. And it says that God took the, 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 the coal and touched his lips. And this is a symbolic utterance of the cleansing that happened in the temple, but also a foreshadowing of the ultimate cleansing of Christ. The, when Christ would bear our burdens and bear our shame and bear our sin and drink the cup of God's wrath so that we wouldn't have to. We are not under the due wages of the law because Christ took our punishment. He paid for our guilt with his innocence. We are free from the wages of the law because Christ took our punishment. And because of this, we are free not only from the judicial consequences of our sin, but we are also free from the slavery of sin itself. 
We are, we are in a more and more way as we conform to the image of Christ, becoming more like Christ. We don't only have the ability to see sin for what it is, but we actually have the ability not to sin. Now hear me, I'm not saying that you can live a sinless, perfect life. Faith is not about having, um, you know, th this idea that we can find perfection in and of ourselves. It means that those of us who have been reborn in Christ are being conformed to the image of Christ through the washing of his word and through the power of the spirit living in us. And ultimately one day, by God's grace, we will be glorified and with him forever. Verse 16, how do you know that if you present yourselves or excuse me, verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are the slaves of the ones whom which you obey, either a slave of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So here Paul presents a general axiom of the accusation that the gospel is causing sin to abound. What is an axiom? An axiom is a general truth that is so apparent that it need not be proved. It's a self-apparent truth. That's what an axiom is. You don't have to prove it. it. It proves itself. And so Paul is using this axiom to explain. Obedience is evidence of allegiance. <clears throat> This is the problem with the way many people present the gospel. They make it seem like we're asking Jesus into our hearts by saying a magic prayer without any thought of the qualifications or the cost. Yes, the gospel is a gift of God. And yes, it is free to us, but it was not free. It was secured with a price that we could not pay. Like that old hymn says, what does it say? I owed a debt I could not pay but he paid it for us. He paid it all. And so Christ paid the debt. He paid the, the judicial consequence. It would be like if, if you owed the, the courts, you know, $10 billion and every day the, the interest was compounding on itself. And they said, listen, we're going to keep you in prison until this debt is paid. Even though you can't pay the debt, you could be free if the debt could be paid. And so Jesus was the only one able to pay the debt. There's no place in the Bible where it tells us to ask Jesus into our heart. It tells us to abandon our lives, our will, our way, and follow Jesus. And in true regeneration or in truly being reborn like Jesus talks about in John chapter 3, we will not only have the desire to follow Jesus and leave our lives of sin behind, but we also have the power to do it. Not perfectly, but genuinely. And more and more as we grow in sanctification. So let me just stop here and talk about two theological concepts that I think many Christians, young Christians, and even some older Christians get confused about. The doctrine of justification and the doctrine of sanctification. See, there are many people who live under a sort of legalistic works-based mindset that believe that they are at various stages of being saved based on their performance. The truth about Christianity is this, that we are saved through faith in Christ alone. We are saved through grace alone by faith alone, in Christ alone. And the moment that we are reborn in Christ, listen, we're not on probation. We are justified bef before God on the basis of what Christ did for us on the cross. Justification is instant. Justification is permanent. Justification cannot be undone by your works. Now, people get confused sometimes because they say, wait a minute, so you're saying that I can say this prayer and, 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 and say I'm a Christian and that I'm saved and then I can do whatever I want? No. What I'm saying is, is if you are truly saved, if you are truly justified before God, if you have been reborn into the new man, then your new nature will want to walk with God. Now we could spend 
hours here talking about the battle between sin and the battle between doing right and doing wrong. But the, 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 the question isn't, can you lose your salvation? The question is, if you, if you are living in unrepentant sin with no shattering stain to your conscience and you can just go on living, the question isn't, did you lose your salvation? The question is, were you ever a Christian? That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith. Listen, self-examination is not just part of the early Christian life, it's part of the entire Christian life. As we gaze at the cross of Christ, for those of us in Christ, it's this encouragement, even in my failure and sin, that Christ has got me, that nothing can snatch me from his hand. Justification is something Christ secured for us on the cross. And if we are really reborn into Christ, we are justified before God. Now, sanctification is this gradual, over the course of your life, conforming to the image of Christ. It's not sinless perfection. It's growing and being refined by fire. See, Christians and non-Christians alike both sin. The difference is, is once you were reborn in Christ, the sin that you once loved, you now hate. I remember being a, a, a recent convert many years ago and being a drug addict and an alcoholic and having lived sowing my life to the flesh for the totality of my life. And I remember many times falling into sin as I'm trying to live for God and questioning if I was really in Christ. But here's the truth. I was sad not just because of the consequences of my sin. I was actually sad because I was sinning. See, that's the difference between believers and non-believers. Everybody in, in the world mourns the consequence of their sin, right? If you do wrong and it costs you something. If you do wrong and it, and it causes inconvenience in your life. You do wrong and there's a penalty or a punishment in this life. It, it makes your relationship strange. It, it causes you to get in some sort of trouble. Everybody mourns the consequence of sin. But the believer mourns sin itself. We mourn sin, and the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Justification happens at conversion, and sanctification is us laying down sin. And this is what Paul is talking about. Listen, don't live like you're under slavery to sin anymore. Strive towards God. Listen, because if you're really in Christ, you'll want to. And what he's saying is, this, what he's going to say by chapter 8 is, and if that's true, then the Spirit of God that lives in you will testify that you belong to God to the point by which you can cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy God. You won't need a man. Here, here's, please hear this. Please hear this. When you are in the darkest place of your life as a Christian, there's going to come a point in your life where the words of no man will comfort you. There's going to come a time where you need to know you're in Christ because the Spirit of God inside of you testifies that you belong to Him. In the darkest moment of your life, when you're burying a loved one, when you're dealing with the most vile sin in this world or the most uh, dark tragedy of this life, you will need to know, you will need to find your assurance in God, something in Christ, something in you, not something external from you. The truly converted person wants to obey God. We are not sinless as Christians, but we do hate the sin we once loved because we are now devoted slaves to righteousness, because we are devoted slaves to Christ, the Greek word doulos. It's a, it's a word that even some translations shy away from using because they don't like the word slave. We don't care for that sort, of, that sort of verbiage. It has a negative connotation in our life. But the reality is we are slaves to sin. And if we are sanctified and, and or, uh, justified and being sanctified in Christ, then we are slaves to Christ, devoted slaves We are not sinless as Christians, but we do hate the sin we once loved because we are now devoted slaves to righteousness because we are devoted slaves to Christ. 
And you can't be the slave to two different masters. You will obey the one and despise the other. You can, you can lie to yourself. You can be self-deceived about what you're following. But the Bible makes it clear. You cannot serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24 says, these are the words of Jesus. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Now here he's talking about money, but that truth applies everywhere in life. You cannot serve God and serve the world. You cannot live for God and live for yourself. That's why Jesus in Matthew 16, 24 says, listen, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross, which is an instrument of death, and follow me. Verse 25, whoever would save their life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. I pastored for nearly the last decade in Oklahoma, and I, I picked up a few uh, country sayings that I've added into my preaching. A country, an old country preacher said it this way, you can hold on to the tail of two horses for a moment, but not for too long. Because eventually, those powerful stallions are going to go different directions. And one of two things is going to happen. You're going to let go of one and be drugged by the other, or you're going to let go of the other and be drugged by the other. If you try to hold on to both of them, you will be torn apart. There is no fence. There is no middle ground. Listen, I'm not talking about legalistic works. I'm talking about the true identity of Christ that we have that makes our mind to follow him. Listen, Matthew 16, 24 isn't something for mature Christians. This is the narrow path to Christianity. It's not about reciting a prayer you don't mean to a God you're not interested in following. It's about seeing the eternal value of Christ and abandoning your life for the glory of God as he remakes you from the inside out. It's putting your faith in Christ above all else. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. I'll say it this way. You can't call him Savior if you don't call him Lord. Paul is not speaking about merely outward righteousness that his audience would have been very accustomed to because of the, the, the Jewish legal system, the Jewish religious system that he was up against. He's not talking merely about outward righteousness. That's why in verse 17 he says, because you have become obedient from the heart. Listen, obedience doesn't save you, but it is a fruit or evidence that you are saved. True faith in the Son of God is evidenced by the way we react to His Word. Many people today believe that they can have salvation in Christ while denying the words of God. But you cannot. It's a contradiction. You are a slave to the master you obey. To reject the word of God is to reject Christ himself. Now, please hear me. I'm not saying that you have to have a, a robust theological understanding of the word of God to be a Christian. The thief on the cross saw the value of Christ and put his faith in him. And Christ said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. But I suspect if that man would have came down off the cross, his life would have been different. Just like all the true followers of Jesus' life were perfect, not, but different, yes, ever-changing, conforming to the image of Christ. We've got to remember that it's the Spirit of God that's conforming us to the image of Christ. But if we can look at His sacred, holy, and errant Word and say, no, I don't believe that part's real. I don't believe that's a sin anymore. I don't accept that part. You are denying God Himself. Why am I saying that? Because how can you deny one part of God's Word and accept the other part of God's Word? How can you do that? Listen, either you believe by faith 
that this is the word and that Christ is the word made flesh and you devote your life to following the obedient and obedience to teaching of God, or you're probably not a Christian. Now, will there be seasons of falling away? Sure. I'm not the Holy Spirit, I, I, and I'm not God. I don't decide if you're a Christian. I don't decide who's a Christian. Bodie Bauckham says it this way a lot, and I, I like it. He says, uh, I don't write the mill, I just deliver it. And so I'm not trying to uh, make a speculation about your life. I want you to examine yourself according to God's word like I do and like all other believers do because the Spirit of God and the Word of God will work together to conform you to the image of Christ. And if you are far away and you belong to God, He will draw you back. The true Christian whose heart is reborn in Christ strives to live a life of obedience from the heart. To what? Their version of Christ? No, to the teaching of God's Word, to the image of Christ given to us uh, in the witness of the apostles and the prophets. Our commitment to Christ is evidence in our commitment to His Word. Obviously, no one completely comprehends the entirety of God's Word, but here Paul is saying those who are no longer slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which they were committed. We've committed ourselves to God. We've dedicated our lives to God. We, we were water baptized in obedience, signifying to the world that our old life is in the ground and we have risen to life with a new nature, with new priorities, with new values, with new ambition, and with one singular purpose, and that is to glorify God in all that we do. We are saved through the work of Christ alone, not by works, but we are willing and willing to be grateful slaves of Christ. Pastor John MacArthur says it this way, the life-changing work of salvation is by God's power alone, but it does not work apart from man's will. God has no unwilling children in his family and no unwilling citizens in his kingdom. So we believe by faith. And our faith is evidenced by our lives. Our regeneration is evidenced by our lives. Now, sometimes the, the seed is way below the surface. I mean, when I first gave my life to God, there was probably people who looked at me and said, that dude is jacked up. <laughs> that guy definitely isn't a Christian. They didn't know what was happening inside, the wrestling, the change. But eventually, eventually from the ground, little sproutlets started popping up. Not that I was trying hard to do better, but that I was being remade from the inside out by the power of the Spirit of God as I strive to obey the teaching of God's Word. Remember this, we don't strive to be accepted by God. We don't, we don't do good works to be accepted by God. We live our life that way because we know by faith we are. We are accepted by God. Theologian Warren Wiersbe once said this, a great evidence of true salvation is found in a newfound reverence for the word of God and a deep desire to obey it. When I see a true convert, I see someone who is awakened to God's word, that, that desires to know God's word. You know why? Because we desire to know God. And this is the most significant revelation God has given us of himself in this world. Either you are a slave to sin or you are a slave to righteousness. There is no other option. You are either dead in sin and trespass or you are alive in Christ. This is why in New Covenant theology, we often hear the true follower of Christ referred to as the new man. Verse 19, he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So Paul acknowledges that regeneration is something beyond what human explanations can wholly and truly define but he is using the example of a slave and a master because it makes a very clear point. 
Paul has made clear that although he is calling for his hearer to strive to live a life of obedience and holiness towards God, he isn't preaching that Christianity is merely a moral and ethical discipline that we're working towards, but rather it's a new nature that we're working from and working out and conditioning and disciplining. There can be no true sanctification without regeneration. In other words, we can't conform to the image of Christ if we haven't been reborn in Christ. That's why when Jesus was dealing with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he said no one can come into the kingdom of God unless he be born again. There can be no true sanctification without regeneration Works righteousness under the law and legalism teaches that we obey so that we can be accepted by God. But true Christianity teaches that we obey because we are accepted by God. And Paul is saying here, since we are reborn in Christ, since that's a reality, if that's a reality, then let us present our bodies, our members, as devoted, obedient slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. So just like lawlessness leads to more lawlessness and sin begot sin, he's saying, listen, strive towards your new nature. Do works that that promote and grow you in Christ. Listen to voices that are encouraging you in the faith. I tell this to people all the time, and I used to have to tell people in Teen Challenge this all the time. Listen, I'm, I'm not saying your lost loved ones don't love you. I'm just saying they don't have a real valid way to encourage you because they don't have the basic presupposition of your nature. They don't mean their intentions aren't good. You need voices in your life that are telling you God's word and sanctifying you and growing you up in the faith. That's why we must attend church That's why we must not forsake the gathering of ourselves together. That's why we must be students of God's word. This isn't legalistic works. If you want to know God, you will do the things to know God. If you are known by God, you want to know God more and more. Only a good tree can bear good fruit, and only those who have truly been reborn in Christ can be sanctified by the Holy Spirit and conform to the very image of Christ. This is why Paul says in Romans 12, 1 through 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is because the truly regenerate person wants to be able to discern between what God's will is and what is not God's will. What is pleasing to God and what is not pleasing to God. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, As you go on living this righteous life and practice it with all your might and energy and all your time, you will find the process that went on before in which you went from bad to worse and became viler and viler, is entirely reversed. You will be some you 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 will be someone who is cleaner and cleaner and purer and purer and holier and holier and more and more conformed to the image of the Son of God. Now there will be these moments where it seems like our sanctification is in pause mode. There will be these seasons of enduring and fighting through sin and and trying to overcome lust of your flesh and lust of your eyes and the pride of this life. But the true Christian has the desire to wrestle with these things. So we can't superimpose the idea of wrestling with these things on unregenerate, unreborn people. They need the gospel. They need the gospel of grace. And for those of us in Christ, we need conforming to the image of Christ, so that we are not any longer conformed to this world, but transformed. We have, have the Bible says we have a brand new heart. Now we need to transform our debased way of thinking. Listen, this is something undeniably supernatural. Being born in Christ is something undeniably supernatural. Christianity is about a resurrection. 
It is not about mostly good people who are working hard at being ethical or moral. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting from that time, from the things of which you are now ashamed? For, for the end of those things is death. One of the great indicators of true regeneration is that we become aware of the sinfulness of our sin. This is why you have to truly become aware of the holiness of God, because we see God for who he is, right? We see God as holy and perfect and unapproachable and unknowable. And we see ourselves in light of God's perfection. And when we get close to the light, what does it do? It exposes our imperfection. It, it, it exposes our insufficiency. It exposes our inability. It shows us our need for God himself. The character of God shows us we are not God. And from that place, we accept the grace of God. Someone who lives by faith, knowing that apart from God, they can do absolutely nothing in regards to saving themselves. The great indicator of true regeneration is we become aware of the sinfulness of sin. And this is become beca because we become aware of the holiness of God. We don't devalue how grievous our sin was before God or even our sin now. Because to do so is to devalue the holiness of God, the offense that God has towards sin, which also devalues the immense value of his grace and forgiveness and the means by which we were given it. We devalue the value of the cross if we act like sin isn't grievous. If sin isn't that bad. And there's many people in the church today who do this. They're doing it in an attempt to reach lost people. Hey, don't worry about your pastor sinning. I understand what they're trying to say. But listen, we need to exemplify and magnify the grievousness of sin. And at the same time, uh, uh, exemplify and magnify the grace by which God secured our salvation. The offense of the cross, the necessity and exclusivity of Christ. We should be ashamed of our past sin. It is the conviction of sin that exposes our need for Christ. The glory and the grace of Christ isn't magnified when we play down sin or the holy nature of God. Christ is magnified and most greatly glorified when we acknowledge the holiness of God, the grievousness of sin, and the cross, the cross by which Christ reconciled us to a holy God. Listen, God isn't, is not any less angry at sin than he's ever been. The difference is Jesus came to save sinners. That's the message the world needs to hear. Not that your sin isn't sin anymore, but Jesus came to save sinners. God took on flesh and walked among us, died a brutal death, and rose from the dead so that we could be reconciled to a holy God. There is a difference between being ashamed of sin and mourning our sin and being convicted of sin and living in condemnation of our sin. We should be convicted of our sin. We should be ashamed of our past sin, but we shouldn't live in condemnation over it. I don't live in condemnation over the fact that I was a drug addict and a liar and a criminal and all those sort of things. In fact, that's the testimony and the platform on which I've built my ministry or which God has built my ministry. Showing that I, I, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. That's what we tell the world. We're not judging you. We don't have the authority to judge you. We're telling you that just like you, I was a lost sinner and God's grace saved me. Verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we're truly saved and born again, we will want to live lives of obedience and holiness. And we will want to be conformed to the image of Christ. Here's the end. The fruit of your life is the evidence of your heart's condition. And this is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to examine yourselves. 
to see if you're truly in the faith. He says, test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. Self-examination, according to the Word of God, putting the, the, the perfect standard of Scripture up to our lives is a conditioning post. It's a discipline. Those of us who want to grow in Christ do this willingly. Listen, self-examination is a healthy part of any part of your life, but self-examination is also a healthy part of the Christian life because those of us who are truly in Christ, our sin will drive us to more dependence on the cross as God helps us overcome that sin. And sometimes it don't happen all at once. And sometimes it's a long, painful season. But at the end of that season, we are more convinced that Christ is saving us. And we are more convinced that God is changing us by his spirit. And that the scripture is true and it says, listen, Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. He's the one who's saving you, not yourself. Here's the final verse. I just want to touch on this real quickly as we close. Verse 23, of chapter, chapter 6, it's a very famous verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, sin is a disease that's progressive and gets worse and always leads to death. Hear me, brothers and sisters. The outcome of sin is always death. Always. The outcome of sin is always death. Because it disconnects us from the source of life. That is what happened to Adam and Eve. And this has been humanity's problem from that time on. Sin that leads to death. But for those of us who are in Christ, the innocence of Christ on the cross paid the price paid the right, listen, God himself in Christ, right? He endured your punishment. A death happened. But like it says in Hebrews 7, because he's also God, he is a priest forever. Why? Because he's a Levitical priest. No, on the, on the evidence of the value of his indestructible life. What does Jesus say in, in John 16, 33? Listen, in this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And listen, brothers and sisters, if we are in Christ, so have we because we are connected to the source of life. And that source of life will be evidenced in our desire, our hunger and thirst for righteousness that God promises he will satisfy. So sin always leads to death. Remember, it says the wages of sin is death. What are wages? Wages are, are something you're owed, something you deserve. Like when you work, you don't go to your boss and say, hey, if you're feeling nice this week, maybe pay me something. No, no, no. You earned those wages. And at the end of the week, they, you deserve them. And the same is true of sin. See, we have to see sin as something we've earned, something we deserve. That way, when we see the grace of God, we see it as something that is truly a free gift. Sin leads to death but Christ leads to life. And this is a free gift that we don't deserve and we could never earn. No scripture in the Bible sums this up better than this. I'm gonna read one final scripture, then I'll close in prayer. But this scripture in Ephesians really does sum up what we're saying here. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you were dead in trespass and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that's now at work and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. Even then, when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages 
he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. Listen, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. For we are the workmanship created in Christ, Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared before that we should walk in them. We are not saved by our works, but God has saved us to do good works. Listen, the wages of sin is death. And for those of us who are in Christ, listen, we have been freed from the penalty of that. Why? Because we had potential or because we, we, you know, we were a somebody or because we came from the right family? No, because of God's great love for us. And listen, if we find ourselves saved in that love, Romans chapter 8 tells us that nothing in creation, no sin, no past, no future, listen, no angel, no demon, nothing, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And this is the cross. And this is why we are justified. And this is how we are sanctified. And brothers and sisters, because of God's goodness, this is ultimately through what we will be glorified. Being a Christian is about being pardoned from your sins. It's about the mercy of God. God didn't give you what you deserved. He didn't give you your wages. Christ took them. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. But God is so lavish. He didn't just pardon us from the penalty and the wages of our sin. He also gave us grace. Mercy's not getting what you do deserve, but grace is getting something you don't deserve. So he said, listen, you're pardoned from your past sins. But not only that, I want you to be part of the eternal family of God. This is the love of God in the gospel. It's not by works. It's not by might. It's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. God, I thank you for this day that you've made. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to to be conformed to your image, Lord, through the reading and proclaiming of your word. Lord, I pray that my words, Lord, uh, which have no power will be empowered, God, that they will, your word will find its mark in the hearts of men and women listening to this here in Colorado, but also around the world on our YouTube channel. Lord, I just thank you for the work you're doing in your kingdom. God, I thank you for the work you're doing through your people. But Lord, I'm most thankful for the work you're doing in us because you love us. We love you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.